Hi, I'm Dave Tabb, and today I'm going to talk with you about the seven basic tools of quality for biological mass spectrometry. Uh, this is a, based on a talk that I did at the International Mass Spectrometry Conference as a tutorial uh, for people learning how to do quality control in mass spectrometry. That said, a lot of what I'm talking about has direct relationship to core facilities uh, in biological mass spectrometry, but they also have bearing on graduate students who are trying to do the work that will get them uh, published and, and graduated. So I think that this talk has a little bit of value for everybody. Um, along, uh, I'm going to start by explaining why LC-MSMS in particular has a particular need for quality assessment. Um, it's a, a technology that a lot of people use today, but not as many people are currently doing quality assessment on. Uh, and from there, I'm going to talk about the seven basic tools of quality uh, that were originally published way back in 1976. And as I talk about each one, I'm going to be giving examples of how that could play out in action in, uh, in, the, in the use of a mass spectrometry facility. And from that will flow several recommendations. But I'm going to try to do all three of those on each tool as we go, rather than uh, trying to do one big sum up at the, at the very end. So let's start with a, a little pictogram of how shotgun or bottom-up proteomics takes place. We start with a protein mixture um, because that's what biology gives us. And from there, we can digest to peptides, handle some sort of fractionation, for example, by mud pit, use liquid chromatography for doing a reversed phase separation of peptides on the basis of hydrophobicity. We then ionize the, peptide, uh, the peptides that are coming out of the column, uh, and they create this plume of ions that we can measure two different ways, shown on the second row. The first is that we're measuring the ions, uh, the peptide ions in intact form, usually through a high-resolution mass spectrometer like an Orbitrap, and we're also doing a measurement on the fragments produced from individual ions observed in the mass spectrometry. So we're going to collect a whole bunch of ions at the same mass to charge, which is to say a whole bunch of ions of a particular peptide. We're usually going to use something like collision-induced dissociation or higher energy collisional dissociation um, to collide these peptide ions with gas molecules, which causes them to heat up and to eventually break their peptide bonds. And then we collect the fragment ions produced from a given peptide in a tandem mass spectrum. Um, there are a bunch of other videos on this channel that document that process, so I won't go into a lot of it here. But uh, at the moment, just keep in mind that mass spectra represent which ions are seen before fragmentation, and the tandem mass spectrum represents the kind of the death cry of an individual peptide breaking apart to produce these fragment ions. Now, as should have been apparent as I walked you through uh, all those steps, I think that was nine different steps in the previous slide, um, you probably realized that shotgun proteomics is actually pretty complex, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong with it because of this complexity. So the, the principle that I would have you take away from this is that any time you increase the technological complexity required to get your result, the variability in that result will also change. Um, just to take a, a really simple example, if you are asking about the uh, coefficient of variation for uh, peptide ion intensities, um, you'll see that if you look at a bulk proteome, the CV values will be um, considerably lower than they would be than if you use something like phosphopeptide enrichment as part of that pipeline. So we're adding just one extra step, the enrichment for phosphopeptides, but we see that the coefficient of variation uh, on quantity suddenly becomes a lot more ragged as a result. So any increase in technological complexity is likely to be met with an increase in variability. So let's talk about those stages. This first bullet point is doing a lot of work. I've called it extraction and enrichment or fractionation. So the process by which we turn a biological sample into a protein extract um, can vary quite a lot, whether you're working with um, a biopsy from a human tumor or uh, a cell culture. So I, I, I'm not uh, actually all that knowledgeable on all of these different processes, but certainly the way that we go about preparing proteins for a proteomic sample differ based on what kind of sample is our input. 
Enrichment is another challenging one. Now, I, I just mentioned one example of that, using phosphoproteome enrichment. Um, for example, a titan titanium dioxide column would be one type of enrichment. Um, but you can also see things like people enriching for particular organelles to get organeller fractions of samples. Um, and uh, I've even seen people use flow sorting um, to uh, pull out just cellular exosomes, for example. So those enrichments are also ways that variability can enter our experiments. And certainly fractionation has a, a large contribution to variability. Um, if you're doing a single shot of LC-MS-MS for your experiment, that means you're using roughly 90 minutes of mass spectrometer time to dig into the peptides available in a sample. That's kind of the simplest type of bulk proteome work that we do these days. But fractionation helps us deal with samples where we have more than 10,000, more than 100,000 peptides uh, that are available in that sample for analysis. So we might use something like basic reverse phase liquid chromatography, or we might use gel CMS or mud pit, as I mentioned before, it's kind of an older technique now, but we, we have all these different strategies that allow us to turn one sample into multiple LC MS MS experiments. Using fractionation will certainly increase the variability of detection. Then we move on to things like protein denaturation. Uh, did, we, uh, did we have a fresh batch of urea or did we have a, a kind of old one that had developed some, uh, some, some bad tendencies? Um, how did we reduce and alkylate disulfide bonds? Um, if you use too much iodoacetamide, for example, you might end up labeling not just free sulfhydryls in the cystines, but also mark the n termini of peptides, and that's not so great. Um, and certainly the way we do digestion matters. Um, changes, for example, in the hydrophobicity of the sample when you apply trypsin can greatly change how the digestion proceeds. And if you start the digestion when you leave the lab one night and come in the next morning, well, the trypsin, has, the trypsin digest has run more than eight hours, hasn't it? So I, I think that we have to be careful in regulating how all of these steps are done to limit the variability they introduce just as much as possible. And a very good friend of mine at NIST, Steve Stein, uh, once, once explained to me that when variability is the problem, it's almost always the answer that chromatography has led to that problem. Liquid chromatography, as employed in proteomics, is frequently quite ragged, uh, and it has a, a lot of variability in how wide a given peak may appear, which ions are uh, appearing at the same retention times, and so on. So how we do chromatography and how we do the ionization process, um, those certainly have bearing on the variability in our experiments. And it might be that your mass spectrometer is having a good day or the mass spectrometer could be having a bad day. Oh, I, I talk about it as though the, the mass spectrometer is a person and that's not strictly speaking true, but it's certainly the case that mass spectrometers uh, produce very different results when given the same samples, say a week apart or a month apart, certainly. <clears throat> Um, so your, your instrument might have drifted uh, against its calibration, its tune might be slightly different, have a dirty quad, for example, or something like that. Um, it might be that the, the uh, gas pressure uh, has, has changed a little bit and as a result CID changes. Um, so that, th these are uh, clear places where variability can enter the experiment. And now this last bullet point might seem a little controversial. Um, how is it possible that a computer uh, could change its mind about what a sample contains. But I think that a lot of people who work in bioinformatics for mass spectrometry will be happy to tell you that a lot of the techniques we use, for example, for deciding which spectra have been successfully identified and which ones have not, often use some sort of statistical sampling as part of that process. And the sampling is a random one, so that if you, if you run the same uh, software pipeline on the same, raw, uh, the same raw files multiple times, you will get slight differences in which spectra are claimed to be identified. And that could be a little shocking for people, but it is in fact true. And even if that, even if that weren't the case, certainly the way that people work up a given experiment can change quite a lot. If I change from using just SwissProt proteins to uh, using the complete Uniprot reference proteome for a species, I certainly expect differences in what I'm going to identify. So it's, it's important to keep all of these processes very static, very controlled. If I change from 
version 1.6 of software to version 2.1 of software, can I expect the identifications the, the, this software produces will be completely unchanged? Certainly not. I can expect change because uh, all of these steps um, have some amount of variability wrapped up in them. So how, why, why am I talking about that the same sample could give us different results? Why is it that if I run a shotgun proteomics experiment on the same sample five times, I get five different lists of peptides? It shouldn't seem possible. Well, we start with the fact that every proteomic sample, even if it's just BSA digested, contains more, pos uh, more peptides than the mass spectrometer can sample comprehensively in MSMS. There's always some amount of sampling that goes on. Yes, if you just digest up BSA and shoot that same sample many times, there are some peptides you're going to see every time. But I think if you look at the data closely, for example, through semi-triptych or unconstrained database search, you will see that sometimes minority peptides um, are produced at different frequencies. If you have a peptide that, uh, that requires two missed trypsin cleavages, that's not one that you're likely to see every time you digest the sample. So we, we see that there are some peptides that appear with much lower um, prominence than do others. Potential trypsin digestion sites have different probabilities of cutting percentage associated with them. It might be that some of these uh, trypsin digestion uh, cuts are always made, but others are far less likely to be chopped every time. Imagine if you have two lysines in a row, for example, or a lysine next to a proline. That cuts with a very different probability than does a lysine that's just surrounded by a bunch of, say, alanine. And it's not the only thing that can cut peptide bonds. You might have bonus um, digestion proteases in your sample, or you might zorch the peptides if they, if they come off a source that's set up a little too hot, that has a, a little bit higher voltage on it than you'd like. As a result, a peptide is in competition with other peptides and the other stuff in your sample that can ionize for the available protons in electrospray ionization. If it fails to get enough protons, uh, it's, it's not going to be ionized to a level that, we, that we're going to select it for tandem mass spectrometry, and it may not produce, as a result, it would not produce any tandem mass spectrum. Um, certainly, even if you collect a tandem mass spectrum for a peptide, it's possible that it would fail to be identified simply because there's too little signal there uh, and the instrument simply, the mass analyzer is not sensitive enough to pick it up based on such a small number of copies of the ion. Or it might be that other peptides are co-isolated with it. So two peptide ions, different sequences, may have very similar retention times and very similar mass to charge values and so getting a tandem mass spectrum of just one and not the other can become a problem. Okay, now, now that we've talked about why LC-MSMS is variable, let's talk about the seven basic tools of quality and how they relate to it. Now, this book is an ancient one, and you might think, why is Dave talking about a book from the 1970s? And I'll simply say it's because it's a hugely influential book went through something like 20 editions. It's, it's an incredible, um, a, 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 a real trendsetter in the world of quality control. And that's why I think it's valuable to, to look at these seven basic tools of quality uh, that were all derived from this book. Okay, so we're going to talk about check sheets, cause and effect diagrams, control charts, histograms, Pareto charts, scatter diagrams, and stratification and sampling. Um, how these seven charts uh, get named differs a little bit from website to website. Um, and I, I should note that uh, uh, Kairu, Kairu Ishikawa, who wrote this book, did not write about the seven basic tools of quality, but these are loosely drawn from chapters in his book. That's why I, I would definitely credit him as the inventor of it. Okay, you might think that a check sheet is something that goes hand in hand with an SOP. Now, if you've never heard the term SOP before, it might be that uh, a little time working in, uh, uh, in uh, industry could be very valuable to you because SOPs are a very valuable tool that uh, industries make extensive use of, and yet fewer academic laboratories make use of them. It is a standard operating procedure, which is to say that every time you do a trypsin digest, uh, 
you follow this particular set of steps. You might think then that a check sheet is something that says, uh, did I do step one? I put a check in the box, I move on. Did I do step two? I put a check in the second box. But that's not what we're talking about. Check sheets are not simply to say, yes, I did it. In fact, Keiru goes through four different uh, examples of check sheets uh, in, his, in his book that I think are all worth thinking about. We have a production process distribution check. A production, pro well, sorry, I'll, I'll speak American for a moment. A production process distribution check. Um, is the distribution of this metric within specification? So one of the ways that we might do this is to say, our mass spectrometer LC MSMS -MS experiment is a process. Just the, the, the instrument collecting its raw file after we hit the go button, essentially. So we might say, how can we determine whether that process is, uh, is behaving as expected? So one of the most common things that I see would be folks who pull up the TIC, the, the uh, total ion current, for a particular raw file and say, what is the maximum value that I saw for TIC? Was it something times 10 to the 9th or something times 10 to the 10th? Um, those, those numbers would probably seem relatively ordinary for this instrument, therefore, um, we're in a good place. So in, a, in this check sheet, I wouldn't simply say the TIC, TIC is good. I would write down what the maximum TIC value was to, to be my check against the range that was allowable for that. When I talk about charge state distribution, um, this is something that has particular relevance in the field where I'm working now, top-down proteomics. Um, but even for bottom-up proteomics, this can be quite useful. What would you say if you collected a raw file from a sample and 50% of the ions that you uh, subjected to tandem mass spectrometry had, singly, had single charges on them? Now, if you're working with a multi toff that's a very reasonable thing to happen. But if you're dealing with an electrospray ionization source, seeing a huge fraction of plus ones is very, very bad. So we have this context, context specificity as well, that which instrument you're, or which process you're evaluating um, will determine how you evaluate what comes out. And certainly, people need this for quantitative mass spectrometry. Uh, if you are using standard peptides, as your guide to how retention times are shifting among multiple uh, raw files, then writing down the retention times at which those standard peptides appear is very valuable to you in understanding the drift in liquid chromatography. Next, we have defective item and location checks. How many of each defect did we observe and where did we observe them? I'm kind of conflating two different uh, check sheets that, uh, that uh, Ishikawa includes in the book. So I would uh, suggest that we think about this in terms of missingness and column clogging. Well, the column clogging one is pretty straightforward. Um, we, can, we could treat a raw file in which no signal was observed for two minutes while the uh, electrospray um, was interrupted and then restarted um, as a defective raw file. So uh, we would want to know that, but it would also be valuable for us to know uh, our column clogs more common at the start of an experiment or at the end of an experiment or in the middle of the experiment when we use uh, this type of column versus that type of column, etc. That kind of defective item and location check gives us information about how to avoid column clogs as an ongoing problem. But even when everything goes fine with, a raw, uh, with collecting the raw file and with identification, we might have problems with missingness. Now, missingness is kind of a challenging problem, but um, Imagine that you are trying to quantify a protein and you've decided that these three peptide sequences are the, the three that you're going to use to infer information about the protein as a whole. If you fail to identify that peptide in a particular raw file, you won't have a quantity for it. That would be bad. Or maybe you're using some software that features match between run. In a case like that, the software may say, well, I didn't identify this peptide in this experiment, but I did in these others. And so I can guess that it should have appeared between this retention time and that retention time in the file where it was not identified. So I can still integrate a peak for it, even though it wasn't identified. These things help us to mitigate missingness. But sometimes we may have to remove proteins from our list to quantify because missingness is too high or 
looked at from the other axis, it might be that one experiment had a much higher degree of missingness than did another. As a result, we can say, well, its sensitivity wasn't so hot, I'd better toss it out. Okay, so uh, defective item and location checks certainly have bearing for us, even if all the action is taking place within the mass spectrometer. Okay, now the last two bullets here, defective cause checks and checkup confirmation checks, are ones that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. But um, in the defective cause check, we want to try to do a bit of cause and effect sleuthing, um, although this is a, a difficult thing to establish um, in, a, in a rigorous way. We want to understand what the relationship of defects is to the instrument, the operator, or the time. Now, those, those are just three factors, but you could blow this out to five factors quite easily. Um, and check up confirmation checks give us a way to, um, to, to put a seal of approval on a final product. So you might imagine that a core facility, in handing off data to a, a, a researcher, wants to make sure that all the steps they expected to complete have, in fact, been completed. So on defective cause check sheet, I, I mentioned I wanted to look at three different factors. Now, I, uh, I spent five years living in South Africa, and I'm moving back there right away. And there were two names that I hadn't heard before moving uh, to South Africa, but I, uh, I had friends named Bongani and Tendeka, and I just love those names. So I've, I've listed them here as our instrument operators. Imagine now that our core facility has two different mass spectrometers. One is the Q-Exactive, and the other is the Fusion Lumos. Um, so uh, Bongani and Tendeka both operated both machines. And sometimes they were collecting uh, data on Mondays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays or Fridays, and I, I can see that uh, I'm going to split out when my defects took place over the last year on a given day for a given instrument for a given operator. So just to be clear, both Bongani and Tendeka produced hundreds of raw files or thousands of raw files across this, this time interval. And here I'm just putting an X for which instrument, which person, and which day uh, a defective raw file came about. So what we see is that Bongani has one, two, three failed experiments on the Q-Exactive, and on the Fusion Lumos, Bongani has one, two, three, four. Uh, so he has a total of seven uh, uh, defective files out of this long time span. Uh, Tendeka had one, two, three on the Q-Exactive, one on the Fusion Lumos, so we can say she has four. So we could, um, we could just as a, a first guess here, and of course these data are completely made up, um, it, we could say Bongani had more instrument fails than did Tendeka because he had seven to her four. Um, we could also then ask about how Q-Exactive versus Fusion Lumos uh, plays out. So the Q-Exactive had one, two, three, four, five, six fails. The Fusion Lumos had one, two, three, four, five fails. So the two instruments produce failed raw files in roughly equivalent time. But then we also want to look at it broken out on the day axis. Here we see that on Mondays, we had one, two, three, four, five, six fails out of uh, a total of one, two, three, four, five, eleven 11 fails. So about half of our errors happened on Mondays. And I think what everyone can agree uh, is the, re the, the, the summary from the spreadsheet is that we shouldn't come to work on Mondays because that's clearly when all the errors are happening. <laughs> all right, uh, next up. Let's talk about this checkup confirmation check sheet. Um, yes, we want to record that all SOP steps were completed when there's an aberration where somebody needed to do something other than what the SOP stated. We want to ensure that all of those have special notations uh, associated with them. Just as a basic check, one might say we are about to ship these 24 raw files uh, to the laboratory that shipped us the sample. So we should expect that the number of LC-MSMS experiments equals the sample count times the fraction count. If I had five fractions collected from each of five samples and I'm shipping them 24 raw files, that suggests a mistake, <laughs> that there's a missing file. So being able to uh, confirm that the experiment design conforms to the, uh, the output that, that we're providing makes sense. Have we tested for potential outliers? Well, this is a difficult one. Um, I have some suggestions on how to go about doing that, but uh, uh, this, is, this is not that talk. Um, so I'll simply say um, it's valuable for us to be able to detect 
if a particular raw file, for example, has half as many identified peptides as, as the others do. That sort of thing is, is a, a big red flag. And hopefully, you've had some sort of quality control sample data that came along with those experiments. Um, I find that it's very valuable to ask what fraction of all MS-MS scans did, that we collected were identified. Now, you cannot expect that that fraction will, will be a high number in every kind of sample. Yes, if you're shooting uh, microbial guts on a, on a mass spec uh, and, you, and sample is in no way limiting, you can shoot just as much of the sample as you want, you're going to identify a much higher fraction of the tandem mass spectra than you will if you do something like clinical biofluids. Clinical bio, biofluids frequently drive our identification percentage below 10%, um, and that is a very frustrating reality of, of doing, say, serum or plasma uh, proteomics at, at this point. Um, pulling away the most abundant proteins can help some on that count. And also, um, certainly before a manuscript is submitted, do we have a proteome exchange accession number? Do we have a, a PXD number uh, for the sample? That is certainly something that we want to have on file before we send in the paper for a review, because a lot of reviewers have gotten rather persnickety if you upload your data saying you will upload it, they would really much rather see that your data exists in the server the moment you submit that paper. Okay, cause and effect diagrams. Um, this is sometimes called the fishbone diagram um, because of the way that these, uh, these, uh, these arrows kind of come together in a common axis. But the other name that we frequently see for them is Ishikawa diagram. So this, this is a, a type of figure that was first introduced by Ishikawa. So what are the main factors that contribute to a quality characteristic? Now here I've, I'm showing a, a diagram from a, a mass spec review by my friend Wout Bittremia. And I'd, I'd say that there are a couple ways that this diagram differs from what I'm describing here. For example, at the right, I simply say variability. But do I mean variability in what was identified? Do I mean variability uh, in high coefficients of variation for peptide ion intensities? Variability can take a lot of forms. So I think it's best uh, to, to put together as concrete a, um, a, a metric definition as you can to say what type of variability uh, you are, you're, you're seeking to capture. Ishikawa recommends that you use four main factors in most cases, which is to say raw materials, equipment, the method of work, and the measuring method. So the raw materials here would probably be the type of sample uh, that uh, is, is handed to you. The equipment would be the mass spec, the columns, the pumps, um, uh, the, the reagents for that, for that uh, part. Um, method of work tends to be something like the, the uh, standard operating procedures. What are the pieces within that that could be messed up? Um, do, we, do we find that uh, different technicians uh, tend to be stingy or uh, or generous with uh, pipette man. I, I don't know. There, there are lots of ways that variability can creep into the way that we implement um, our protocols. And finally, the measuring method, which in this case is almost always going to be the mass spectrometer or the mass spectrometer plus software downstream. Now, the, the next thing that you can see is that each of these four main factors shown by the big bubbles um, at the ends of those four arrows um, we see that there are other arrows that have been added to break down those larger factors into detailed factors. And uh, frankly, in, in Ishikawa's book, you'll see that these detailed factors get broken up into sub-factors, and sometimes the sub-factors get split into minute factors. So um, you can draw an Ishikawa diagram of more than two levels, certainly. Um, and uh, it's a very, very good way, uh, he notes, when you have a room full of people who are trying to talk over why a problem is occurring, a fishbone diagram on the whiteboard can be a really good way to capture everybody's input and try to, to flow that all together into one hierarchy. So it's a, a nice diagram to use as a guide to discussion. Now, the Schuhart process control chart uh, frequently looks a little different from this. This is a diagram taken from the Guide to Quality Control in 1976. Um, and I'll just explain that the control chart illustrates whether each of the points on the graph, um, moving from left to right, we're looking at 
um, ancient history to the present. Um, in this case, we have, I believe, 15 data points. So the 15th maybe represents the data we collected yesterday, and the data points all the way at the left represent, uh, say, three work weeks ago, um, assuming that we did um, quality, th this quality control sample five times each day. Um, you can see that n equals five at the top of this uh, diagram over here at the right. Okay, so in this case, um, we want to ask, is the instrument in normal uh, operating um, mode or are, are we getting some abnormalities? Um, has the process of measurement changed um, based on these quality control data that we've collected? Um, we often call it a control chart because we have uh, we, ha we place limits on what we expect these numbers to change by. Uh, so let's just say then that I'm, I'm going to look just at the data from three weeks ago. I have five replicate measurements that I made on that day. And I now want to ask, um, what is the average value for the five experiments I performed? Now, here we see our scale is running from 20 to say 35. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what, the, what number this represents, but maybe we're asking what was the number of distinct peptides we identified in our BSA digest? That, that's a fine thing to do. So um, I might say that three weeks ago, I measured um, 19 uh, peptides from my BSA mix um, when I took the average of my five measurements. Um, uh, so if we look at that measurement over time, we see that there's this general tendency upward in our case. It might mean that our instrument is, um, is completing bake-out from uh, an instrument maintenance or, or something like that. It's hard to know what, what rationale would cause this in particular. These, these data were divine, uh, were, th th this figure was created before tandem mass spectrometry proteomics existed. So I'm just telling stories at the moment about how, how we could think about this. So I wanted to note that on the averages at the top part of this graph, we have three lines. We have an upper control limit, we have a lower control limit, and we have an X double bar. So I would start by saying often when statisticians uh, talk about taking the, the arithmetic mean or average of five samples, um, they call that the, the bar value. So we had five values of, uh, of X that were observed, we take the average and that average is then called X bar. So we're plotting X bar. However, this instrument is not one that we've measured for just the last three weeks. It's one that we've measured for more than three months. So we have a historical backlog of, of data sets from this instrument. We can compute the average of those averages across this space of three months. So our middle bar here, X double bar, is the average of the averages. This is the historical average of how many peptides we see from our BSA digests on this instrument using this process. Okay, then we have an upper control limit and a lower control limit. Typically, um, we've used the, the historical data to tell us what the distribution of those data points looks like. Of, the, the, of these average values for five samples. Um, and so we can say, what is two standard deviations up from that average? And what's two standard deviations down from that average? Now in the future, when we plot the average of five experiments for that day, we can ask, is it above the upper control limit? Is it below the lower control limit? We expect that on average, a, uh, the, this measurement will fall outside either the upper control limit or lower control limit 5% of the time because two standard deviations in normally distributed data give us that kind of uh, expectation. Okay, so in this case we have uh, some points at the beginning that look too low, we have some points at the end that look too high. Now Ishikawa goes a little further with the data. He's not just interested in the average, he also looks at the range. So remember that we're measuring five shots on each day, and we can ask what is the highest value minus the lowest value, and that gives us a range estimate. Similarly, we can compute the range average uh, across the three months of time, for example, that we're, we've looked at for this instrument, and we can compute an upper control limit. Now, what does it mean that we have no lower control limit on range? 
And the rationale here is quite simple. We don't put a lower control limit on range because it's clear what the, the, lower, con what the lower limit is. The lowest possible uh, range that you can have is zero. So the, that's always going to be a hard lower bound on the range. Okay, um, if you're interested in how these evolved since 1976 to uh, be used in a little more contemporary methods, I suggest you look at Schuhart process control charts. Um, and there's a really good page from NIST here. You can uh, download the slides from a link in the description. Um, and it will, it will uh, help walk you through how we build these today. Okay, so what are the kinds of things we might measure with a process control chart? We would like to do longitudinal monitoring very frequently when we're looking at this, which is to say, across a long swath of time, how does this instrument behave? How does this process behave? So repeated experiments, the same samples uh, being analyzed in the same method by the same instrument, we want to evaluate the degree of change. So it might be that we have a particular test sample uh, in which we are trying to measure a set of particular peptides, of pre-specified peptides. So we might want to know, excuse me, is the retention time for that peptide drifting back and forth or is it staying pretty steady? It might be that we're doing label-free quantitation and so being able to understand, um, given that we've spiked in a particular amount of protein in all of our experimental samples, we might want to know, is the intensity we attribute to that protein spike changing or not um, across these samples. You might want to use that as a way to normalize um, the signals that come out of the intensities of other proteins. Is the number of distinct peptides that we're observing from a complex quality assurance sample uh, changing? So it might be that I'm shooting um, HeLa digest, um, human, human cells, on my instrument every day, and I want to know, is the sensitivity of this instrument holding steady for the same process from the same sample? Or it might be that you're doing technical measurements. You're measuring the voltages of your instrument. Maybe you're measuring the temperature of, uh, in the, the mass spec room. Very frequently we see that, uh, uh, that laboratories don't have as much stability in that temperature as they would like. I, I would just mention that at one point at Vanderbilt um, many years ago, we had this problem that the instruments seemed to be behaving in a really hinky way and we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Um, in the end, we realized that they had painted the hallway outside and the instrument was picking up on um, some extra ions from that mess. So yeah, um, environmental features will certainly affect your instrument. Um, all right, and then finally we get to mass accuracies drift with time, um, particularly if you're working with the time of flight instrument, but also if you're working with Orbitrap instruments, being able to evaluate what kind of mass accuracy you're getting for known ions as a, uh, as a, a response to time is very important. It's also valuable to note that you don't have to look at individual metrics individually. It's possible using an approach called hoteling T squared to combine multiple metrics, um, maybe spanning all kinds of features, that, lots of features here from this page, um, into a single value that you can use to evaluate, is this instrument in control or out of control? Okay, just a moment, I need to take a quick sip of water. Okay, histograms. Um, you might say to yourself, what could possibly be novel about a histogram? But I would simply note that this book was written in 1976, whereas the first spreadsheet software for the PC, uh, well, in this case for an, an Apple, uh, Apple computer, was developed in 1978. So imagine that instead of having the computer make your histogram for you, you must do it by hand. This is a process that, that Ishikawa guides people through step-by-step step on how to build a histogram if you've never done one. It's a really valuable piece of, uh, of contribution because I, I think that um, it's very useful for people to think about the kinds of choices that come into play as we build histograms. So what is the shape of the distribution? Is it safe to assume that any quality metric will always have a mean value with all of its data points within two standard deviations? No. You can't do that because lots of metrics that we might want to, to, to use to characterize an experiment are not normally distributed. As a result, you need to know what the shape of the distribution is. Is it symmetric? Does that mean it's normal? No. There are lots of distributions of data points that are symmetric without actually being normal. 
Is it skewed? Is it, does it push to one side or the other? Is it bimodal? What does it mean to be bimodal? Imagine that I was um, writing down the height of adult humans. Um, if I simply write down the height of everyone at age 21, um, I'm going to see what's called a bimodal graph. And the reason here is that typically men and women have different heights, uh, different average heights, and probably differences in their standard deviations too. Bimodality means that the shape of the distribution has two humps. So bimodality is a very important thing to know about your data if you're collecting it. What is the relationship of the values that you see from the distribution of this metric versus the specifications? What percentage of them are out of specification? What is the, uh, what is the mode? What is the most frequently seen value? Um, though it, it, does it line up with where it should? That, that's the sort of thing that we can use to think about what the histogram teaches us. And is there a need to change the histogram? Uh, do we see that um, we need to separate, for example, uh, men from women in our, in our height distributions so that each of them is separately normal? Um, is it necessary uh, to change the, the widths of bins that we use for continuously distributed metrics in order to make sure that all of the bins have enough data points in them? Um, when we look over at the right, we see this histogram about how much error was detected between what the instrument told us the mass of a peptide precursor was and what we know it to be based on the peptide sequence. Um, in this case, if we had a, a distribution that didn't have an average value of zero or a mode value of zero, uh, we would be kind of concerned about that because it would in indicate that the instrument was out of calibration. Okay, uh, next up, we get to Pareto charts. Um, this Pareto chart that we're seeing on screen uh, comes from a paper by Mike Berriman, um, and I, I really want to do a, a tribute to Michael. Um, we lost uh, Michael, I think, a couple years ago now, um, but he was one of the people most influential in um, the American Society for Mass Spectrometry in making sure that people were thinking about quality control. So um, I'm always going to feature a diagram from him because I, I really respected his work a lot. Um, so Berriman uh, used this Pareto chart to explain why uh, quantities derived from individual peptides were rejected in a, a long-term study that they were doing. So we see that uh, there were 30 examples of peaks that they rejected because the retention time was far enough askew that they didn't trust the value. Then we see that there's, let us say, five or six peak areas that seem to be um, incongruous with what we expected, um, so they rejected those five. Then we have full width half maximum. Does everyone see FWHM? That's the width of the peak um, when you look at half of its height. Um, so they, uh, they felt that, uh, say, two, uh, two or three of the, the uh, quantitations had to be rejected on the basis of peak width. And finally, peak symmetry. They felt that those uh, that they rejected one or two uh, non-conformers because the peaks weren't symmetric. But I want to note that the way this is illustrated is using two different y-axes. On the left, we see the scale that relates to the bar heights. But on the right, we see a cumulative percentage. Here we're asking what fraction of all of the non-conformers have been explained by this and every cause to its left. So the first peak, retention time, um, is accounting for about 75% of all of the non-conformers, and so the, the dot appears right at the top of that bar. When we move to the next, we see that the line moves upward very slightly um, to reflect that now we're not looking at just the percentage relating to peak areas, we're adding the, the, area for, uh, the, the height of peak areas to retention time, that gives us this higher cumulative percentage. And when you've accounted for every possible non-conformer, you finally reach 100%. So there's an ordering that goes on in, this, in a Pareto chart. Here we put the most common cause of failure at the left and the least common cause of failure at the right. So this, is, this descending order causes us to understand what topics need the most energy from us? Where should we invest our effort uh, 
in order to reduce by the largest factor the number of failures in these experiments. So that's uh, th this gives rise to the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. Roughly 80% of the outcomes come from 20% of the causes. This is a uh, <laughs> we, we often uh, joke that we spend the first 20% of our effort on a project getting 80% of it done, and the last 80% of our effort getting 20 per the last 20% done. It's kind of the same principle here. So we, we often find that when we look among our causes of failure, they're not all even Stephen in their contribution to failure. Very frequently, there's one or two that dominate over everything else. Um, of course, it was is valuable to use scatter diagrams. Um, and I, I have to say, Ishikawa is rather optimistic, I think, about what he believes scatter di diagrams are good for, for using. So why make use of an XY scatter plot? He feels that they are the obvious way to relate cause to effect. In other words, if you can see that uh, a, a big shift in column vol uh, in, uh, in the, the voltage in your instrument, uh, is associated with um, a, a reduction by half in peptide sensitivity, that maybe that's what's causing the problem. Uh, I think any, any person who studies causality will tell you that there's a lot more to diagnosing what cause led to this effect. So I'm, I, I felt like this was a, a common mistake and one that I would have preferred was not in this particular book, but say la vie. More generally, I would say it's safer to say that we discover covariance, correlation, or association when we look at scatter plots. Um, if you see that the instruments, uh, that the experiments that identify the, uh, the most peptides are also those in which we collect the largest number of tandem mass spectra, it's quite clear that uh, these, these two concepts go hand in hand. An instrument that can collect more spectra is likely to identify more peptides as well, just by having more spectra to choose from. Um, so that could be covariance. Um, it could be a correlation in that when one goes high, the other also goes high, and when one goes low, the other also goes low. Um, but to say that these are associated rather than causal is a whole lot safer. Um, but I think it's also worth mentioning that very frequently, people make use of a multidimensional um, a, a, a dimension reduction technique called principal components analysis very, very frequently. As a result, um, I think that one of the most common types of XY scatter plots that we see are principal component an analyses projections. Now, I call it a projection because the PCA will almost always give you more than two factors or two components back when you feed it a whole bunch of different metrics and ask how do the experiments cluster. Now, in the, the diagram I'm showing you at the right, these, uh, this figure was created um, to show how a, an Orbitrap Velos performed over the space of eight months. Eight months of time is a long time to spend with one instrument being solely dedicated to one set of samples. Um, but these are the data collected from the colon cancer CPTAC paper um, uh, published by Bing Zhang et al. Um, so the Rob Slebos paper down here at the bottom is our assessment of the quality control and, and um, uh, the bioinformatics necessary for making that paper possible. And here we're looking at the first two principal components um, as, a, as a way to detect how much that instrument wandered across the space on some 1400 raw files. So it was a, 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 an ambitious experiment and it was intriguing for us to see that uh, the different batches of uh, the 10 different batches of samples actually covered quite a lot of space as the instruments, uh, for lack of a better term, personality changed over the space of these eight months. Stratification and sampling is a, is a rather complex topic and one that we don't talk about enough outside of biostatistics classes. But I was really glad to see that Ishikawa notes stratification and sampling are really, really valuable to us. So let's discuss this stratification concept. If samples fall into different categories um, or metrics fall into different categories, stratification gives us the ability to incorporate those factors in a model. Now over at the right, I'm showing you an old figure from a paper I published back in 2009. Um, but this is, this is asking about 
repeatability, which is to say that in this case, we were shooting yeast um, in single LC-MS-MS experiments on all of these different instruments that you can see, four Orbitraps and three LTQs. Each of these yeast samples was shot uh, three different times on those instruments, spaced out by a few hours, if I recall correctly. Uh, and so now we're asking, what fraction of all of the uh, of all of the peptides were observed in all three replicates, in two of the three replicates, or in one of the three replicates? At the left, I'm showing triptych peptides, which is to say the peptides that we would expect to be produced by a full triptych digestion. What we see is that something like oh half of the peptides or less uh, or fewer are are appearing in one replicate only. The other half are either seen in two or three replicates uh, from that instrument. Over at the right, we see a more pessimistic story. These are semi-triptic peptides, which is to say these peptides conform to a trypsin cleavage on one end, but they do not on the other. What we see in this case is that um, something like 60% of all of the peptides, of the semi-triptic peptides that we see are appearing in only one replicate and not in two or three. So this is, uh, this is one of those cases where doing stratification um, helps us to understand that two different distributions are in effect. The triptych peptides are observed at higher reproducibility, or sorry, higher repeatability for each instrument than are the semi-triptych peptides. If you leave triptych, triptych status out of it, you'll see all of these data uh, combined together and you might miss the fact that there's this difference between these two classes of peptides. That's an example of stratification. I really feel that Ishikawa could say more about sampling, but I'm, I'm very glad that it makes it into the book. Um, in his case, he's not talking about bootstrapping or one of those advanced um, statistical concepts, but rather about literally picking uh, products out of bins um, that have been uh, produced by a particular industrial pipeline. So populations display a frequency distribution. So you have to be careful to maintain a strictly random sampling when you're sniffing products to say, where are they failing, for example. Um, so in other words, don't just select or pick up good pieces or bad pieces. Do not take samples from only one portion of the lot, say the first ones off the line, but take the ones that came off in the mid-afternoon too. The samples must be truly representative of the lot if, if that sample is going to give you um, good meaning. So I, I would argue that one of the things that people most frequently make this mistake on in proteomics is that they only look at um, protein biomarkers, for example, that have very, very low p-values and ask um, and, and try to use those to understand how everything in that sample is distributed. It is possible that the, the proteins that produce very low p-values actually have very weird looking data compared to the rest of the sample. So I, I definitely think that if you're trying to understand the bulk of your data, the examples you draw upon need to be drawn from throughout all of the data, not just the good stuff and not just the bad stuff. Okay, this brings us to the end. Um, and I hope you get several takeaways from this. First off, the seven basic tools are intended as a guide to action, to action. We, we often think, okay, well, I'll do this plot of my, of my quality data uh, because I was asked to by the peer reviewer. But honestly, if you're going to go through the trouble of, of doing quality control, hopefully you learn something from producing these visualizations or producing um, these tables. The seven basic tools are intended to help you figure out how to change your process, how to improve your SOP, how to um, put the instrument in a more stable position so that in general, variability is diminishing as your team develops experience in it. We expect by this process that old experiments are something we learn from, that the, the first experiments we do for a particular fractionation technique tell us 
a lot of things that we don't want to repeat that we need to fix to have lower variability in the future. These, these seven basic tools were defined a long time before MSMS-based proteomics. Uh, it's not until basically the, the 1980s that we see people uh, matching tandem mass spectra to peptide sequences. So a full decade before that, um, Ishikawa was, was publishing these seven basic tools. They are just as relevant as ever to guiding how LC-MSMS will continue to evolve. Everybody should know something about the seven basic tools in my view. All biological mass spectrometry facilities should incorporate quality control in their everyday workflows, ensuring that tomorrow's processes are based on careful audits of yesterday's experiments. I, uh, frankly, uh, the, best, the best core facilities that I work with are ones that are able to produce a quality control report that accompanies the bunch of raw files. We, we should expect as clients of core facilities to have some sort of explanation about whether the instrument was having a good or bad day. And if, if the core facility ran HeLa samples on my day, um, one of the things that we can use that for is diagnosing whether the data that came back from my samples looked kind of sketch because uh, my sample was bad or because their instrument was having a bad day. If the, if the mass spec, mass spec uh, facility can send me raw files saying, no, no, we shot HeLa before your samples and after your samples, and the, the, the identification sensitivity was fantastic. So this isn't on us. <laughs> it's a, a useful thing for both core facilities and for the users of core facilities to know uh, whether the instrument was performing properly. Okay, and I hope uh, that after this you feel uh, better prepared to talk about quality control um, and to incorporate it into your own work. I hope you'll keep coming back to this channel for more videos because I plan on recording them. So I hope you get to watch them. Thank you very much.